Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Dark Parade. I am very pleased to be bringing you uh, another in a series of movies that could be best labeled stuff I like and therefore want to talk about, and that's what this January has become. So this episode is going to be um, a little bit out of order. I had kind of planned on this being behind the mask and that will still happen. I am not sure when that episode will come to your ears, but uh, sometime within the next you know month or so. And in the meantime though, uh, I bumped up what was supposed to be my grand finale with Mark Ball. And that is uh, of course, American Mary. And it's a movie as you'll hear me say, uh, here in a minute in the discussion that I feel like got a bit of a bad rapper or I feel like it's maligned and maybe that's just my impression. At any rate, you guys can tell me in the comments if you feel like this is a movie that gets a bad rap or uh, I am just a little over the moon for it and therefore uh, a bit in the tank. But I do think it's a great movie and I'm not going to try to convince you guys too much. I'm just going to let the discussion that Mark and I have uh, do the, the speaking for me. So without further ado, thank you as always for uh, listening to the show and welcome once again to the Dark Parade. All right, as promised, my uh, guest with me for this episode is the one and only Mark Ball, um, who is a ball to have on the show. <laughs> so, hello, hello, Bo. Thanks. Thank you for having me back at Dark Parade. We're, we're talking about a super fucked up movie tonight, so I am I'm extremely excited. Yeah. Okay. So when we talked about this previously. You, you and I both said, like, it's been forever since I watched the movie. Yeah. And so I watched it again, and, uh, you know, we'll get into my feelings. But you were just telling me, and that's why I wanted to capture this, You, it turns out you hadn't ever seen it. Yeah, I don't know what the hell movie I was thinking of. I, I could have sworn I had seen this because, well, I mean, this movie is 10 years old this year. Which I uh, also was like, holy shit, has it been that long? It really, it felt like half that time. But yeah, this came out in 2012. So right around the time I met these uh, bunch of hooligans on this show called the Midnight Horror Show. And uh, the, I remember this is one of the early things that we talked about on the show. Like when I joined up with them and it was actually on the show. And we had, uh, I, th I think it's still floating around out there. It's an interview with Tristan Risk who's in this movie. It was like one of the ne next to the time we had Felissa Rose on the show. It was like the two best things, probably still that I've ever done in podcasting. And it, like, I mean, I, a lot of it I sat quietly in the the, the background or whatever. But uh, the, from that Tristan Risk interview came about the origins of the nickname Fancy because I don't know if it was when she was on or if it was before she got there and we brought it up again or something. But at some point of that show, I told the story about. The time I was in Vegas, like, uh, shit, this is probably five to eight years ago now, somewhere around in there. Uh, I was with my older brother, and we were there to see a concert, and it was just, like, four days of just drunken, like, shenanigans in fucking Vegas. And at some point, uh, I had packed, like, some nice dress clothes in case, like, we wanted to go to a, a you know, more classy place. We never end up going to any classy places in Vegas. In fact, we went to this really shithole strip club that's up the, it's like two blocks from the strip or something. And uh, if, 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 if rumor has it, it's true. This is maybe the strip club that Tupac got shot out in front of. Oh, all right. Man, yeah, famous. So, yeah, I mean, in Vegas, like, you, yeah, you wander two blocks from the fucking strip and it's just like a whole different world. It's like it's kind of scary, but also kind of exciting. So anyway, we went, to, we went to the strip club, just blackout fucking drunk. Uh, we had to be on a plane at like four o'clock in the morning, or I'm pretty sure. And, uh, you know, it's it's a strip club. There, there's only like two, it's like a Thursday night or something. So there's only like two strippers working. And at some point, uh, the stripper that kind of, you know how they did, they like just, they, 
they come at you from the bar or whatever. They're they're there to steal your money as quickly as possible, and they got a fair amount of ours that night. Uh, but at some point, the stripper that was like hanging around me and talking to me kind of sat in my lap, and uh, these uh, I, I'd worn my my at least the 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 nice pair of pants that I had. I don't know where I got these, but I remember they're really expensive pair of pants. And the stripper sat in my lap, and uh, I just hear a ripping sound, and it's my my nice dress pants, and they have ripped from basically the zipper like all the way to my lower back, like just a <laughs> giant gaping hole covering everything that should be covered. And uh, I'm pretty sure, like, I yeah, I, I sobered up very quickly, stood up, and was like, "Well, gotta go," and walked back to the hotel with a giant gaping hole in my pants from a strip club. It's like, oh my god. Uh, and so I told the story on that show and Tristan Risk at some point was like, well, that's why you don't wear your fancy slacks to the strip club. <laughs> and the name, I, yeah, then, uh, the, the, the nickname fancy slacks just kind of stuck around for a while. So that's why if you find me online or shit, it says fancy Mark. That's, that's, that's the origin story there. Yeah. I like that because, uh, it involves strip clubs and yep. torn pants but yep. also nothing overtly illegal. No. <laughs> yeah, seeing me, like, from somebody else's point of view, they'd be like, God damn, what is going on in that strip club? It's like the one from the movie, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a gritty-ass, mob-owned, seedy-as-hell uh, kind of club. So, we'll, I mean, <laughs> we'll get into all of this momentarily not, not the strip club stuff but um, <laughs> well i mean kind I of mean, it yeah. does come up and it's gonna come up yeah kind of you're right but i'll say to begin with when i first saw this movie i really really liked it and i felt like uh as the years have gone on i've heard more and more people kind of give this movie shit for one reason or another and I find, when I went back and revisited the movie, uh, I found I probably liked it as much or more than the first time I saw it. Right. Which is one of the reasons that, you know, I kind of want to go back and, and do this for the, you know, <laughs> January, here's a bunch of movies I like uh, season. But also, coming from the perspective of having never seen this, and we'll get into ratings and stuff later, but just what was your initial reaction? Because I almost wish I could go back and watch this for the first time. Because it's really like fucked up, but I found it to be fucked up in the right kind of way. As weird as that sounds. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, this movie, this movie rocked me. Uh, I was not expecting this movie to go, and it's it, it, it does a lot of things really well, and it kind of had me like, uh, yeah, this got, this got a huge reaction out of me. I felt a lot of things watching this movie, and a lot of them were like unpleasant and uncomfortable, but it does that really, really well, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I, right, because it, it's sort of a bummer of a movie. Yeah. But also, it's just done so well. And I, I might make the argument that this is the Soska sisters best movie i'm sure i think other movies of theirs that i've seen i have seen they did the see no evil movies right with uh kane the wrestler i think they did the sequel for sure they did oh, okay they did rabid uh the remake of rabid it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of what i heard so i didn't didn't get around to it too much other shit to watch yeah i mean i don't you know again like everybody everybody's got their own opinions i don't think it came together very well like it it it's not a total train wreck or nothing, but it's, yeah, it's just not great. Um, right. and, and you're remaking rabbit for God's sake. So, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty unique of its time kind of movie, honestly. Yes. Yes. And I mean that in a good way. I, I don't mean that in a negative way. Yeah. But it's also like, you know, it, it, it kind of goes places and not that the remake, eh, it just never, you know, totally comes together. But, um, uh, let's, let's see, what else have they done? There was Dead Hooker in a Trunk was was kind of their, you know, calling card. Right. And then they did American Mary is really their first feature after Dead Hooker in a Trunk, which is super indie. Yeah. And then See No Evil 2. 
uh, a movie called Vendetta, which I don't think I've seen, and Rabid was their last one. And they've done a bunch of TV stuff, uh, like uh, that Elevator show that they've done. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I so, remember that. And you, one thing you can absolutely say about the Soska sisters is they are absolutely advocates for the genre. They love horror films. They're all about it. You know, I, I, I'm never going to impugn the good name of the Soska sisters, even if I'm not a fan of all of their work. But uh, I was a big defender of theirs after seeing this. And uh, and kind of remain so. Like, again, I don't I don't know that I would say that they their their output is great. I think they've done one really, really good movie and then a bunch of other stuff that's like, eh, it's all right, you know. See No Evil 2's got its moments. It's it's not a total uh, slag heap or nothing. Um, but but seeing the, uh, you, you know, not just kind of seeing it for the first time and, and the kind of shock elements of it, but, and also the kind of bummer of it. But I'm curious, like, do you... I, first of all, have you heard the same shit that I've heard where people are like, you know... American Mary, that movie can go fuck itself. Or or just generally kind of negative views of the film. Or am I alone in this? Am I just hanging out with the wrong crowd? Um, not so much about this movie. I know people have kind of, uh, I don't I remember like a year or two ago, there was some controversy about the Sosa, Soska sisters and kind of how they were like, I don't know, just shitty to like a few fans or something. I, I'm not really sure what the whole story is. So, like, I've, I've definitely seen a shift where I don't think they're quite so popular as they used to be. I mean, they still have, like, you know, a pretty good following of, like, pretty hardcore fans that love them. But, um, I don't know, like, among, like, the, the film dorks that I, I see, uh, it definitely, uh, they, they, got, they got soured on her, on them in the last, like, couple years a little bit. But... I don't know. I don't really hear a whole lot of people talking about American Mary so much, which is kind of a shame because uh, I don't know. The, the, I I, have, I do remember people loving it when it came out, and like you know, the the Soska sisters were oft talked about in the horror community, um, but not so much lately. It seems like. Yeah, for sure. So, all right, let's. If you're new to the show. Here's how we're going to do this. We, we, we do this in five stages. One, we're going to talk about kind of here's what the movie's about. Go walk through the plot a little bit. Although not scene by scene. We'll, you know, meander a bit. Uh, then uh, phase two, we talk about the performances, good and bad, that we enjoyed. Phase three is to discuss any themes in the film. Sometimes that is a, a tougher discussion when the movie is pretty uh, superficial. Uh, this, on the other hand, is going to be fun. Uh, then we will rate the movie in phase four. And then the final stage of this booster rocket of horror joy is going to be three facts that you may not know about uh, American Mary. Um, I'll give you one fact early on. The Blu-ray of this that I got said it had director's commentary on it and it don't. And it pissed me <laughs> off. Those bastards. Yeah. Yeah. The, the people at... Uh, who, do, who put this out? Who put out this Blu-ray? Uh, Accelerator? No idea. I guess. But at any rate, <laughs> sure enough, it says there are special features on the disc that I sure as fuck couldn't find. And I mm. looked. I was I, I was searching high and low because I, I wanted to listen to the commentary for sure. But anyway, uh, if, if there is a, a manufacturer of the American Mary Blu-ray listening... Uh, you, you owe both five bucks. Yeah. Yeah, how about you? You know what? Keep the money. Just send me a, a file with the uh, director's commentary and the special features, and, and we'll call it even. There you um, go. But all right, so the movie starts with a look at Catherine Isabel as Mary, who of course is sort of famous for ginger snaps. I guess would be the the big thing prior to this. Oh shit, that's right. She was in ginger snaps like a decade before this movie uh. and uh, it's just been in a bunch of like weird like uh, a 30 days of night sequel called Dark Days um, what else man just a, a laundry list of 
a movie called Ogre, which I've seen, like a sci-fi movie called Ogre, uh, popped up on Supernatural, like just as uh, was doing her her time in the trenches, and I kind of feel like she has reached somewhat of sort of horror royalty to to some degree. I mean, definitely this movie, she fucking earns it. Like how they. I'm kind of surprised there wasn't ever like a sequel to this movie where they just kind of, you know, try to mm-hmm. capitalize on the name or, you know, I'm thinking of like American Psycho 2 kind of kind of deal. They didn't <laughs> right. do that to this movie. Mia Kuna steps in. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I would fucking watch that. Absolutely. Sure. Um, <laughs> but so Catherine Isabel uh, is uh mary the titular mary of the movie and she's a medical student like she's trying to become a surgeon and when we first see her she's like sewing chicken limbs together and shit just doing like practicing the craft of doing stitches and stuff and uh we also know that she's a little bit down on her luck because the telephone company calls her and it's like hey we're about to turn your shit off and uh the other kind of bit of setup is that she's got this uh, teacher named Dr. Grant who is giving her some shit in class you know theoretically about not paying attention but she also fires back the answer that he's looking for to let us know that she is actually a very accomplished student like she knows her shit right and the uh there, he gives this whole bit about like well you know i don't want to waste my time mary and he's an asshole like right from the get-go he's a fucking huge asshole for oh a hundred percent and um, he's totally picking on her like that that, com- that comes up later Louis she's like oh it might be seen that he was kind of picking on me he totally is right there, there's a bit in the early goings where she gets a phone call from her grandmother Nana. From, yeah, from her Nana. And she's like, no, Nana, everything's going good. No, I don't need any money. Uh, I don't have a <laughs> boyfriend. Sweet Nana. Yeah. Oh, poor Nana. And uh, uh, anyway, so she's like, look, I basically, she's got to find a job that can give her some money pretty quick because things are reaching a crisis point. And she sees an ad for uh, basically it's an exotic dancer like no touching you're not gonna get a uh, pod or anything but you know but they give they give massages too which i was like I don't, I don't know if i've heard of that in a strip club maybe that's like a back east kind of thing or something but i don't, I don't know i've never been to a strip club where they offer massages uh right yeah it, that's <laughs> it, that's weird um i don't know that i've ever been to a place like that but also in you know the interest of candor i have not uh done a lot of uh strip club uh patronage per se Eh, you're not not missing much and you're much richer for it (laughs) yeah i i think i've been to two or three in my life and every time i went it was a bad experience for one reason or another and i was like "Ah, they're pretty scuzzy yeah yeah it's (laughs) partly that one time i got i just got filthy drunk in one um and and just ended up like puking in the bathroom a bunch and that was no fun uh, classic yeah yeah that seemed pretty par <laughs> for the course one time the first time i ever went to uh, a strip club was right after i turned 18 because my buddy chad that i do uh, pick six movies with he shows up at my door and is like hey you're 18 we're gonna take you to a strip club and I am, even at the uh, the wizened age of 18 at that time, I was just not real comfortable around girls. It just was, I, I hadn't had a ton of experience. Like, I'd had a girlfriend and, you know, wasn't a virgin or anything, but I just had no game. You know, it was just like, yeah. I, I, I had to find my girl and then I was cool with her, but I was not great with being around just like naked women. <laughs> few men are it's 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 an intimidating thing a little bit <laughs> so so we go to this strip club and it's not what you would call the creme de la creme 
It's uh, one near the the military base nearby. Oh man! Oh boy! Yeah, the, the I bet they make good money in there. Oh man! There there were some C section scars on display. <laughs> some bullet wounds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was rough. And so, Chad ends up buying me a lap dance. And so, the, you know, the, the stripper in question rolls up on me and is like, come on back to the lap dance room, baby. And I was like, uh, I'd prefer not to. <laughs> can I, can That's I... That's where they steal all of your money. Right, can I say no to this? And... That's when one of the absolutely you should you should shop around. That, that's uh, the little life advice. If you go to the strip club, don't you know? You just shop around, find the girl that you want. Unfortunately, in this case, the bouncer laid a hand on my shoulder and said, "Is this going to be a problem?" And I was oh, like, shit. "Yeah, I was like, uh, <laughs> no, sir." <laughs> <laughs> that's not good. So, yeah, ended up having what had to be one of the most awkward lap dances for me and her. You're just scared. <laughs> I, I was just terrified. I did not want to be there. And I'm like, so, are you going to school? Or <laughs> <laughs> It was it was a real mess. Oh, uh, boy. But, yeah, anyway, back to the movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, she is going to this massage slash uh, strip club. And I like the detail of her bringing a resume... And the guy being like, look, you know, you don't really it's kind need. Of, it's kind of a MacGuffin later in the movie. It, can, it comes back around in a really clever way, kind of. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, anyway, so uh, this guy, Billy Barker is the guy's name. Uh, he gets her to like massage him. And then one of the dudes comes in and is like, hey, we got a little bit of a problem comes in to tell Billy Barker we got a problem and he's like alright we gotta cut this short you gotta get out of here and um, he ends up af after like reading the resume that she's given him and seeing like hey you're a surgeon and she's like yeah <laughs> you're a little overqualified for this job right but and he's like look I got uh, a little bit of an issue here can you help me out with this dude no questions asked and i'll give you what is it five thousand dollars yeah Ju i i need you to help me five thousand dollars no questions asked and she's like all right i guess and she takes him or he takes her downstairs into this room where there's this guy who has been cut up yeah they're like we need to keep rat alive for a little while yeah. do what you can and they hand her like a bottle of like alcohol like for like probably rubbing alcohol or something like a couple of rags or something it's like here you go yeah and it's kind of suggested that they were torturing this dude and it just went too far yep and i, I mean i kind of doubt rat is like his given christian name there's probably a reason that they're calling him that fair enough yeah you're right it, <laughs> it's probably and it's not like a, a loving nickname like tiny or something no rat is pretty specific so uh unfortunately she can't save him. like she does what she can do but he's he's too far gone and uh mary meanwhile is consumed by the idea that like oh somebody might come for her like she has seen too much she does the the scared girl thing where she like yeah don't, locks every all five or six locks on the door uh i mean there's, there's a part where she goes to, like take a shower to wash all the fucking blood off her and stuff and then she hides on the couch with a baseball bat which i feel like is something it's, it's not like a white girl thing i think it's it's something everybody does at some point in their life like when they think there's a burglar or something I like I don't, I don't know there's lots of little weird things like that in this movie that I can kind of relate to yeah yeah uh, but in the sort of wake of this sort of tr very traumatic incident with her saving this dude or trying to save this dude and being unsuccessful and, and realizing that she has brushed elbows with some really seedy individuals by the way ah, she's doing gangsta shit right yeah like she she was a mob doctor for a few minutes there. 
And then she starts getting a call from uh, a girl that we'll eventually know is Beatrice, is her name, as played by Tristan Risk, uh, as you mentioned. And she is calling and is looking for, can I speak to Dr. Mason? You know. <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a great impression. I was going to do mine, but yours is better. So now I'm not doing mine. It's it's not that great. Like, I can only do about four words before it really goes off the rails. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, man. Like, she's... Oh, man. Yeah, she almost steals the show, honestly, in this movie. Tristan Risk is, like, such an incredible, like, performer. And she does all kinds of stuff. She's artistic. She does, like, side sideshow type stuff. Like... Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with her work, like um, some of her bigger stuff, she's in the editor. The mm -hmm. I think it's like the last Astro and Six movie. I'm pretty sure. Um, fuck, I'm trying. She was in a movie that I didn't get a chance to see called uh, Amazon Girls Escape from Prison or something. <laughs> the slides that came out a couple of years ago. Um, but I think how we first found her is she was in a really rad short film called call girl uh directed by jill six who just had a movie come out last year the year before called the stylist mm, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. super rad uh, it also had i can't think of his name but he's the main character in the human centipede 2 um, right the little peter lorry looking dude yeah that dude uh yeah call girl i i hope that's floating around on like vimeo or youtube or some shit where people can see it because that's a pretty rad little short film it's like two or three minutes and Tristan Risk is in it, and she's great. And like the this this was about yeah when we got that interview on the Midnight Horror Shows, I think right after American Mary came out. So um, yeah, she's 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 a fascinating character. You should definitely follow her on the, the social medias. But um, anyway, yeah, her her turn as Beatrice is amazing. I mean, she's she's I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but. Uh, her whole deal is that she wants to look and sound and be like Betty Boop because that's what she feels like on the inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gets she gets a hold of Mary for reasons that I'll let you jump back into. But uh, yeah, the, Tristan Risk fucking steals the show on this thing, man. She's a, she's a covered under a shitload of makeup. She got to do the voice, uh, like even like the way. Like, even when she's just in the background of shots in this movie, she's still doing the Betty Boop thing and, like, is, like, clearly, like, studied up. And it's, it's, this is, like, one of my new favorite performances in a horror movie that's come out in the last, like, 20 years or so. She's so fucking good in this. Yes, she ends up tracking down Mary, essentially. Um, got her information from the from resume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, from yeah. the resume. Uh, and and was uh, one of the dancers at the club, or is one of the dancers at the club, and has tracked Mary down that way, and shows up at her place ultimately, and she, what she wants is Mary to do some work on a friend of hers. She's like, look, you know, there's, uh, and as you said, she explains like I'm, you know. I'm into this body modification. I've turned myself. <laughs> I turned myself into Betty Poop. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Barry's like, yeah, you, you did. I mean, you sure did. Yeah. And she says, well, I've got this friend of mine named Ruby real girl. And she wants somebody to finish her, but they haven't been able to find somebody to do it. And she says, look, I'll give you $2,000 to meet her. Just to show up. Just to show up and meet her. And I'll give you $10,000 if you actually do the procedure. And again, Mary, who is in a real tight financial bind, agrees to do this. Because she's like, well, it's two grand. I'll just show up and meet her and then we're done. And sure enough, uh, the, uh, she goes to meet uh, at a vet office. Which I think is pretty great. It's like, <laughs> so my, my cousin's a veterinary. We could use his office after hours. Yeah. I, I, and I like the girl, um, Tessa, her niece, who who is, <laughs> is the receptionist at this vet clinic. Don't She's be a apparently cunt. A, apparently a raging cocaine addict. She's like, you're never happy unless you're high. Yeah. And is kind of given Beatrice <laughs> and 
and like Ruby and this whole group shit. And I like the fact that Beatrice is like not having of just like like we're not a bunch of addicts, you know. <laughs> like she's she's like, look, you're just being an asshole, and you know none of us like you need your blow so you're gonna shut up and take the money we're gonna give you for letting us use this office and that's gonna be it because we're not gonna <laughs> listen to any more bullshit out of you right and, and again just all these little relationships and moments i really like in this movie and that's one of them and so we meet ruby real girl who is a woman who is trying to uh, essentially turn herself into a living doll a, a human doll but her, her reasoning for it is fucking uh, this, the, this this scene really got to me you want to explain why she wants to become like a living doll kind of well she she starts with saying don't you think it's wrong that people can't look on the outside the way they feel on the inside uh, and she's like I'm sorry that's an unfair question here's what I want you to do is basically she she wants that kind of asexual perfection yeah she did, she doesn't want to be seen as a sexual object so she essentially has like the sexy parts of her either removed or sewed up shall we say yeah and god damn i was like that's a really fu- that's a really fucking interesting kind of idea like there's a, there's a lot to unpack there kind of well, for sure and in fact when she kind of reveals to mary what she wants mary to do mary like leaves the room she's like <laughs> will you wait here for one second hang on one second <laughs> and goes back to beatrice and is like is she fucking serious about this and beatrice is like it's all she wants and she's like all right i just wanted to make sure um 10 grand do you say i can do it and and what what she wants what ruby wants is to have her nipples removed and as much of her vagina sewn up and made smooth as possible so that yeah. it's just uh, basically as small a hole as you can make that still allows her to you know expel urine i guess or whatever and like i don't know if it's like for real stuff or if a lot of it was done with makeup effects because like tristan risk is made to look like she's had a shit ton of plastic surgery on her face and they they did it all with makeup effects like she doesn't really look like she does in this movie obviously but like i i'm not so sure about this girl like or what to what degree and it's not really my place to like comment on something like that but like it's it's pretty obvious that like she's the, this character has had already you know probably and they make comments about it in the scene before too where they're like she's already spent like a billion dollars on fucking plastic surgery and like this is like maybe not like the final step in like her her transformation but it's definitely like you know toward towards the end of the race kind of deal where this is gonna make her feel like complete and there's something really just like I don't want to say sad because like this has like become like even in the last 10 years like a lot more common of a thing where people are like you know not you know it's it's becoming i think more of an accepted thing to be like i don't feel comfortable in my skin and like the person i'm i am on the inside isn't the same person that i am on the outside and there's something like you're just super fucking sad about that to me and like knowing that like for decades and decades before this people just kind of had to suffer through that shit for their whole life well now like i mean especially if you live in like hollywood or california kind of area plastic surgeons are a fucking dime a dozen including like characters kind of like mary that are operating on the outskirts and shifty fucking alleyways and dungeon basement bullshit uh but like yeah there's uh <laughs> this is really where this movie gets going for me and i it was just like holy shit this isn't just like you know just shock value like edgelord bullshit like this movie actually really has something to say yeah a hundred percent and also does a thing that i really like a movie to do which is to give you a peek into a world that you may not be familiar with yeah this and is definitely fringe taboo type of type of subject like not very long ago 10 years ago probably even 
yeah, when the movie came out, like, I, I certainly didn't have a whole lot of familiarity with the idea of, like, body modification and things like that. And especially this kind of extreme version of body mod. And, you know, and you can draw parallels to, you know, uh, transgender issues and stuff like that. I mean, it's all about, like, I want to make my outside match the inside. Yep. And now you have the ability to do it. And especially with someone like Mary and, you know, as we'll get into it, she is, you know, good at what she does. She's ethical. Um, doesn't take any bullshit for sure, but you know, is, is sort of an, if not an ally, at least non judgmental about it. Yeah. And she's interested in interesting work. I think. <laughs> right. Right. Well, yeah, exactly. Like it, it, it's, there's something of a challenge, but uh, before we get to that, the rise of Mary as a body mod, mod surgeon. So she performs the surgery and tells Beatrice, like, hey, she's she's going to be really sore. Keep everything covered. It's going to feel like everything's stretching because it is. So just, you know, if you, if, if you need anything, give me a ring. But uh, don't need anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so she kind of goes back to her life as a would-be surgeon like a you know as a medical student and even uh there you know with with the complaints with this dr grant dude there's also the surgical resident that she's under named dr walsh the other fucking weirdo in this movie right <laughs> in a movie full of weirdos right and I, it's <laughs> no mistake that it's the men in this movie that are the most like dangerous and and creepy yeah uh, uh because Fuck, I, I, oh, god damn i didn't even thought about that yeah it's like the male doctors <laughs> it's the guy who owns the the strip club slash massage parlor like all those dudes are the ones that you have to keep an eye on beatrice and ruby real girl they're not going to cause any problem they may seem weird on the outside but they're not the creeps yep and uh, so Dr. Walsh is impressed by Mary, you know, uh, as, as they're doing their rounds and so forth. Like, he makes her uh, go tell a family that the diagnosis that, you know, they found with this husband was that he had a heart attack. And so she's like, okay, I'll go do that. And she goes in there and, and tells them. And they're like, oh, my God. And she comes back out and he's like, okay, now I need you to go back in there and tell them that he didn't make it. And, you know, and so Mary is forced to go back and tell this family. And she does it very, you know, professionally to the point of being kind of cold and detached about it. But also, how else do you do that? You know, um, but well, they say in that scene, they're like, this will, this will almost become like robotic for you, basically. Like, you, you, this is a hard part of the job, but you have to learn this. And she does it like really, yeah, cold and calculated is how it describes. She doesn't really like bat an eyelash at this, and it's kind of fucking spooky. It is, but also I think there's an element of like she is she is a woman in a man's world. They are gonna throw shit at her, and she's going to she's gonna take it all, and she's gonna yeah. do it as professionally as she can. And so she does. She she does this, and then when uh, she's finished you know just devastating a family in this room she comes out and dr walsh is like you know that was a quite a good job you did there uh, <laughs> i'll tell you what how would you like to come to a little party that a lot of us surgeons uh have you know after hours and she's like all right i'm you know i'm down for that being being one of the gang sure yeah. and she also has received as a gift their uh, Ruby Real Girl is a fashion designer as well as a woman who wants to become a living doll and has gifted her because of the work she did and as a gesture of appreciation uh, sends her this really nice dress that she's designed just for Mary and so Mary gets it on like she's done it up she's looking great goes to this party where sure enough dr grant is there along with dr walsh and uh dr grant then brings her a drink uh they, they're kind of chit-chatting about you know uh her her work and time in school and that kind of thing and th then she starts to get woozy 
and he takes her into another room and she's raped. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a tough scene, but it also isn't exploitative. Like, none of this is intended for titillation, which is one problem that you can run into, especially with old exploitation mil- movies that have rape scenes. Where they're yeah. like, look at her boobies. There's fucking tons of them. We've, we've covered many of them on Doing the Nasty. Yeah, and so this is very much a, like, no, this is an act of violence, and you see her kind of struggling to maintain consciousness and realizing what's going on and unable to stop it. And I mean, it's, it's a rough scene, but yeah, I I think again, thematically, this is sort of what you need. It, 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 it's, it's a huge, it has a huge payoff. A couple scenes from this. It's, it's a really rough watch. And, uh, I, I, I knew it was coming. Because the description for this thing on Amazon Prime totally mentions this shit, and it doesn't happen until like 40 minutes into the fucking movie, so I knew it was coming, and it's still pretty rough, even knowing even knowing that it's in there. Like, uh, yeah, this 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 fucking scene breaks your heart because, like, even though Mary, like I said, is out out, out doing gangster shit and being a fucking back alley surgeon, you've like really kind of grown to kind of like her at this point. I think, like, she's. She's really kind of like stumbled her way into this like semi dark world, but like you know, there's there's still like enough like character motivation. I mean, money is it uh, like that's that's what's motivating her for like the last couple scenes, and like you can understand it. Like she doesn't have to break down and borrow money from Nana. Like she's, right, yeah, she's she's doing what she has to in a fucking, like super fucked up world where the cards are stacked against her. So. Like, you, you really like her up until this point. And yeah, knowing that this was coming, I think it was almost worse. Well, I don't know. Like, I, I can imagine if you didn't know that part was coming. It's, it's probably, like, s- still equally shocking. But yeah. Oh, what a fucking bummer that guys are fucking garbage. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, the worst part of all of this is like, well, that's... It's something that happens all the time, it, you know. Yeah. Uh, of men intentionally getting women drunk up to and including drugging them so that man they... especially in like academia this yeah. is like become more more and re- more relevant every year that's <laughs> such a goddamn fucking bummer so mary uh wakes up she she gets her shit she leaves and um you know it will come we'll circle back to what how she deals with this but basically she quits medical school and you know she's just absolutely had it and she um decides that she's going to go to billy barker the guy who owns the um the the strip club and uh she's like okay i'm gonna basically make a deal with them that i can use their basement and uh anyway so we'll get back to what they do in the basement but she basically they they kidnap grant dr grant and she's like you know i'm here's what i'm gonna do is you you have essentially pushed me into a new line of work and i'm going to have to practice to get good at this new line of work And so here is a book of all the shit that body modifiers ask for. And, uh, you know, what does she say? Like, we're going to be in surgery for 14 hours or something (laughs) as, as I'm trying to figure all this out. So, you know, let's get started. You rapey motherfucker. Yeah. And man, (laughs) this fucking scene. Oh boy. So, um, anyway, it will, it will again circle back to the ultimate fate of Dr. Grant. Cause we only see him whimpering and like understanding that he is good and, and solidly fucked. He's uh, got this big, uh, this big, or is that the later scene where he's got the big clamps that have his mouth like spread open? No, that's this one. Like she, she pulls his tongue out with, uh, some tongs and is like, you know, well, we're going to need to do some piercing and split tongues are really popular. So we're probably going to do that. 
filing down your teeth mm -hmm. implants right just a laundry list of shit that you would not want done to you unless you asked for it yep and uh so uh she finds out later we we leave them at, you know we don't like i said we don't get the payoff of this until a little bit later but um we learn that her work with ruby real girl has gotten some attention from uh the soska sisters as it happens uh who play the demonic twins who run a body modification website uh, called abstract.me and uh, they give her a call because they're like hey we we have something that we would like to do we think the work that you've done on Ruby is fantastic and will you meet with us and uh, she's like okay and somehow I think it's in a conversation with Beatrice that she learns right around this point that Ruby has a husband as well as some boyfriends yep and uh so the demonic twins show up in the u.s from germany they meet her at the the bourbon bar where where <laughs> mary at once upon a time was going to be a dancer and um when they walk in they one of them uh french kisses the dancer on stage and then bites her tongue <laughs> Which everybody's just like, uh, like shocked, but well, uh, <laughs> I guess we're going to tolerate this. Right. We, oh, the two goth looking girls that came in wearing latex and platform heels and the, the heavy makeup and whatnot are acting a little strange. Weird. And they're like walk in unison too. It's yeah. like, uh, it's, it's spooky. <laughs> well, and so what they want is like they brought their own assistant because they're like look there is no way that one surgeon can do this but um essentially what we want you to do is to swap our arms yep and so that we're always together in that way <laughs> which is oh like I, I feel like if I say that that's like an insane thing, like I'm probably only alienating like, you know, four out of a million people probably that would want such a thing done. So we would go ahead and say that it's, it's, it's borderline insane. Right. But people are into, people are, everybody's different. People are into shit. Everybody's got their own weird kinks and all that shit. <laughs> and so, yep. it, right. Yeah. But that's what it is. It is just, you know, hey, will you do this thing? And she's like, well, all right. And we get, uh, I think it's around this point that Billy Barker has his dream about Mary. Where Yeah, he's he's been lusting after her. We haven't really talked about him very much, but he's like kind of a, you know, he's, he's Mary's, I don't know if you call him like a sidekick or something. Uh, but anyway, like he he's totally lusting after her, and was yeah has had some like late night jerk sessions to the he's he's got security cameras all over the strip club, so he's got like a video on his laptop of when Mary came in and gave him a massage, and he's like fantasizing over it, and he's like it's just like ew, dude, you're like a little bit of a fucking perv. Actually, you're a lot of bit of a perv, which kind of sucks because like he's almost likable. Like I mean, he's he's doing like dirty shit in the fucking basement like we cut people up and crazy shit but like he's i mean am i wrong is he is he a little bit likable he is the closest thing you get in this movie to a likable dude for sure okay. like like he's he's definitely shady and he's a little skeevy but he's also in the grand scheme of things seems to be pretty fair with mary in, yeah. in, like in a weird way I would call them more business partners than sidekick of like they have a business arrangement with one another yeah that, that that makes more sense and there is some I think there's some mutual attraction there but also Mary just is in no place mentally to deal with a dude that's into her she's all business well, uh, yes, of course, and also, I mean, had just been raped and is, you know, slowly but surely wreaking her revenge. We'll get to that in a minute, but, yep. you know, like, 
that's why Billy is kind of scared of her as well. <laughs> yep. You know, because in his fantasies, like, not only is she beautiful and dancing around him and whatnot, she's also going to open him up like a, a you know, Christmas turkey. Uh, but, uh, so, as, as, you know, her business is definitely taken off, she starts to get um, a little bit of friction from the police. There's a, a detective kind of sniffing around about the disappearance of Dr. Grant and is like, hey, you know, I'd kind of heard that perhaps you had some friction with him. And, and she's like, ah, you know, he was hard on me, but he was hard on everybody. It's no big deal. And later she tells Billy about this. She's like, fuck, that, you know, people are asking about Grant. What should I do? And he's like, well, you want me to take care of this problem for you? And she's like, no, no, don't make anybody else go missing right now. Because that might be a bit much of a problem. Um, and there, there's one scene that they have in um, her new studio, essentially, where uh, two things about the studio. One, she kicks out a dude that like wants a piercing or something. And she's like, get the fuck out of here. You think that's what I do? Like, I'm not wasting my time. You're so vanilla. Yeah. Kicks him out. And uh, this detective, she gets a glass that uh, uh, of water for him. And at one point, she doses it, like slips him a Mickey. But then changes her mind because the detective is like, look you know, we're starting to get some reports about Dr. Grant that maybe he had taken some liberties with some women. And, you know, were you one of those women? And she's like, no, of course not. I mean, do you have any video or anything? And he's like, no. And she's like, okay, well, then I wasn't. But the detective does kind of suggest, and as far as guys in the movie, maybe this is actually the best character in terms of just I mean, being, like, on the up besides... and up. Besides being a cop, yeah, yeah <laughs> he's well, pretty, he probably is the the closest to being able to be a likable character. Because yeah, he, he says at some point, like he he starts putting the pieces together, and he's like, I I know this dude is a fucking monster, and I want you know people to have some closure as far as all this goes. But I can't help you if you don't help me, kind of deal. And Mary is like, nope, not having it. Right, like, I appreciate you saying that it sounds to you like maybe he got what he deserved, but also, I can't tell you <laughs> what what's going on, because... Yep. That's look, prison time. Yeah, so. I mean, no matter how fucked up what he did was, what I did was equally fucked up in a completely different way. Um, so, which is where we get the reveal of this, after, you know, she gets kind of grilled by the cops. She goes to uh dr grant who is basically just a stump at this point he's like a torso that she is keeping alive and hanging from hooks in his back like richard harris and a man called horse and it's he's fucked up i mean rightfully so nobody's gonna argue that this dude did not get what's coming to him but it is a heinous fate. Yeah, he's got no limbs. His entire, like, yeah, what's left of his torso is covered in bandages and his mouth is sewn shut. And I think one of his ears is missing. Yeah. So he is just being surgically kept alive or medically kept alive so that she can continue to cut shit off of him and practice. And uh, while this is going down... Uh, while she's kind of chatting with him about like maybe I should just put you out of your misery and get rid of you in walks a security guard and so now she is forced to not just kill for the sake of you know retribution she is forced to kill to hide her own crime yep and two of them she's got two corpses basically <laughs> that fucking meat freezer or whatever the hell she's renting yeah yeah, and yeah, and she ends up, you know, getting rid of uh, him as well, um, and uses a taser to to zap him when he tries to wiggle away from her after she kills the security guard. Um, but 
uh, Billy, her, her, you know, business partner and would-be boyfriend, finds out that, oh, like, Dr. Walsh also knew what had happened to Mary and, and knew about what was going on with the other girls. And so Billy, taking matters into his own hands here, kills Dr. Walsh, unbeknownst to Mary. Yep. Mary is going through a real crisis of conscience here because she's like, well, fuck, I didn't mean to kill that security guard. Like, Dr. Grant had it coming, but he, that security guard did not. And maybe I just need to turn myself in and, you know, be done with this. And Beatrice kind of talks her out of this. Uh. And as well as, like, one of the other dudes, one of the heavies at the, at the club, uh, the bouncer slash guard, who's like, look, you had to do what you had to do. And, you know, what you did to Dr. Grant, that was justified. And you had to protect, you had to save yourself. And that's why this, you know, guard was in the wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's also a moment where she, Mary sees this stripper kind of hanging on Billy Barker. Oh no, she he, he, she's not just hanging on him. She's giving him a fucking BJ in the office. Yeah, and so Mary, uh, again, completely unable to process r- her feelings about anything right now, <laughs> just decides like, oh, I'm gonna go kill this bitch yeah, in the she kind of Snaps. Yeah, and, and I mean that's kind of the Frankenstein like journey of this movie is that you are sympathetic with Mary up to a point where you're like, oh, you've just completely lost your shit and are now a dangerous individual. And is, like, acts as if she is about to use her surgical tools to kill this woman, but ends up not, you know. Um, You know, kind of cuts all this short. Uh, But Billy is like, look, man, uh, you're you're starting to kind of lose your focus and your center. And also, the detective is all wired up because, surprise, surprise, a second doctor involved with this shady bullshit going on at the college has gone missing. And so Mary's pissed off about that. And also, Beatrice has quit the club. Um... Or, or hasn't shown up, so he thinks that she's she's up and quit on him. Yeah. And so Mary's just like, all right, I'm going home. He's like, look, how about you and I just go to L.A.? Let's get the fuck away from everything that's happening, you know, here in town. Go to L.A. for a little while, let everything calm down. And then, you know, that way you can get your shit together, I can get my shit together, and we'll see if, you know, there's anything between us, essentially. And she says, you know, I'll I'll honestly think about it, uh, but she heads home. And once she gets home, she gets a phone call from Beatrice, who is not, in fact, blowing off her her gig at the club it's that ruby's husband uh ruby real girl's husband has finally come home and seen what mary uh has done yeah which again is like a oh boy like she's finally exactly the way she wants to be and her husband comes home it's just like horrified to see what mary has done to her it's like oh it's heartbreaking man yeah and so he finds Beatrice and beats the shit out of her to get Mary's name and address. And Beatrice, God bless her, is just like crying bloody. It's like, I'm so sorry, Mary. But unfortunately, the call has come a little bit too late. Yeah. Because Mary now finds this dude at her door. And they get into a, you know, a fight. He he ends up stabbing her in the gut. Uh, she manages to kill him by uh, slitting his throat. 
And I think she bites him. I oh, was that's like, right. She's, she just goes straight for the jugular and rips his fucking throat out. Right. So, yeah, you're right. She does bite his throat out. And, yeah, so he dies. And then Mary, like, crawls into her studio slash surgical theater. <laughs> She's got to open that big-ass door that, like, it's like a... I'm not sure. It's, it's like... I have, like, closets in my house that have, like, those stupid folding, like, doors, basically. And it looks like it weighs a fucking ton, and she's, just, like, trying... It's just laying on her belly, just bleeding to death. And that's to, like, paw it open, kind of. It's like, oh, my God, she's not going to fucking make it, is she? Yeah, so she ends up dying while trying to sew herself up. And, uh, you know, the kind of last shot of the movie is the detective and police coming in to find her with this you know it's a scrapbook yeah of all the shit that she's done <laughs> and this undeniably vaginal wound in her gut that she is trying to stitch up uh, yep. and has died doing that and you know everybody like the pieces all fall into place and stuff as Ave Maria plays and it's gorgeous it's a great shot yeah and and they're into the movie that is you know the tale of american mary is the journey of this girl who just gets you know fucked metaphorically and literally to the point that she kind of becomes a monster and like she can't live by the rules of movies she can't survive this because she has murdered someone who is innocent yeah, there, there's no happy ending coming. Like, but it's still a drag because, it, like, even throughout all this insane shit, like, you're still there's a part of you because, like, they they do play back and forth kind of with Mary's morality, like from scene to scene. In some scenes, she is just like a fucking like her face is just like stone, and she is like just not there and like cutting people up like crazy but other scenes like she like feels bad about some of this shit and like questions it and she's still talking to nana all through the movie up until like there's a scene like a, a, a couple scenes like before the very ending where uh she I, I, she's like returning a call to nana i think and doesn't get through and like leaves her a voicemail and then like there's a hard cut to her like the next day or whatever and she's deleting Nana's number out of her phone. And you're like, oh dude, you fucking, this movie even killed Nana. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no happy endings for basically anybody in this movie except for maybe like the bouncer or the cop. Like, you know, <laughs> that's that's about it. Uh, but yeah, holy shit, man. What, what a fucking movie. Yeah. And, and so let's talk about some of the performances here because this movie would be nothing without the the uh, actors in it. And right. Like, right off the bat, Catherine Isabel is incredible in this movie. Yep. You this know? is like a, a career-defining performance. She, she is female Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, she's, you know, <laughs> a little, little Sweeney Todd kind of vibes there too because, yeah... Uh, she she is fucking incredible in this movie. Yeah, I mean it's she runs the gamut. She's you know wounded and scared and sympathetic and funny and sexy and scary. Like it's everything you would want as an actor. Just like oh, I get to do everything in this movie. Okay. Yep. Uh, and and she just kills it. Oh my god, she is amazing in this. And I uh, her performing surgery and you know platform heels and whatnot it's a little ridiculous but also you're like god damn you have style lady um, <laughs> um antonio cupo as billy barker uh i think is very good like he's a nice counterpoint to her like he he kind of starts rough and tumble but you sort of understand his attraction to mary and and I, I agree with you. I do think that he genuinely has affection for her that isn't just, you know, sexual or whatever. Like, he sees kind of a kindred spirit in her. Yeah. 
Because he's, I mean, the, he's around topless to totally naked chicks all day, every day. Like, I mean, the, he, he definitely sees something in Mary that's like, you know, he, it's, the, for, that's that's his unhappy head ending of this movie is that the, his, his his white whale got away, you know? Yeah. <laughs> she she was the one. Yeah. Even though she's fucking crazy. <laughs> Um, and, and I think the other two performances I would call out here are Paula Lindbergh as Ruby Real Girl and Tristan Risk, as we talked about, as Beatrice. Um, both of whom, like, and, and Tristan Risk is really the all-star there, because, uh, Paula Lindbergh isn't in it that much. I think she's very good when she is. Yeah. But as being kind of the two representatives of this body modification lifestyle that particularly Tristan Risk again is like she's so like fun and funny and really optimistic and sweet and you like you kind of as you're I think you're supposed to in the movie there's a point in the movie where you start to look past the fact that she looks like Betty Boop and you're just like oh she's kind of a great person yeah and, and I mean, the fact that she wanted to look like Betty Boop, well, that's whatever. But, you know, if, if that's what makes her happy, then great, because Beatrice deserves to be happy, because Beatrice is a really nice person who also, you know, hilariously gives shit to her niece, but is really kind of wonderful and kind to everybody else in her life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, man, what a fucking... <laughs> Like I said earlier, I think almost steals the show, even though yeah, she's only in a handful of scenes or whatever. And this is uh, maybe one of Tristan Risk's best performances. I don't know. That's, I still got to feel. It's weird to me that I haven't seen a lot of the movies that like these people that we had on the fucking podcast back in the day. Like ten years later, I, I still haven't got around to seeing some of their other of their other stuff. But um, yeah, anyway, yeah, Beatrice is great. I don't know who the dude is that plays the bouncer, but he has a really great scene. Like we, like we mentioned before, where he's just—it's like in any other movie, this would be like a—it's just two people sitting there talking about shit kind of scene. But really, like it comes like after a cool down of like you know Mary doing some fucked up shit, and he just sits her down and is like, you know what, this awful thing happened to my mom like years and years ago, and if I had been like in the right place at the right time i would have done some fucking really awful shit to the guy that did it and like you know you have the opportunity now with some of the fucked up shit that you're doing to you know not feel that way basically like to, you know it's a it's a <laughs> it's a carpe diem kind of scene uh but yeah that that dude is great he he is like I don't think he's like playing a character. I get the feeling that that dude is just really like that. He's just a dude that the Soska sisters knew that were like, oh yeah, he's this giant bouncer looking dude, but also he's like kind of a fucking teddy bear. And like, you know, he's he, like, maybe not every strip club, but I feel like most strip clubs need a, need a dude like that. That's like, you know, not, not a creep or a perv, but he's like doing his job and does it really well and like keeps an eye on the, the girls in the club basically. Yeah, that is uh, a guy named Tuan Holiday is his name. I think he met the Soska sisters through their association with wrestling because he's a professional wrestler as oh, well. Oh, no shit. Or, or used okay. to be. Did that, did some stuntman work, has done some acting, um, you know, done crew stuff. Like he's, you know, kind of a ham and egger uh, sort of dude in, in, in L.A., one would assume. Are um, the Soska sisters? This is a weird question, but are the Soska sisters Canadian? I kind of I think, forgot about that. I think they are. So uh, a lot of these people are probably like Toronto and Vancouver, like regulars kind of deal. I'm ninety percent sure Tristan is a Canadian. Yeah, but uh, I don't know about the rest of these people. Confirmed. The Soska sisters are in fact born in uh, British Columbia. Okay, that makes sense. So. um yeah and uh yeah i i think you're right he he's got a a lot of uh a lot of presence and and has a that great scene uh anybody else you want to call out i mean the the guys who played the doctors were great but you know just at being garbage 
Yeah, they're the super villains of this movie, and they, they, they do it really well. Cause, yeah, the one guy is a fucking dick, like, right from the get-go, and is yelling at her because her phone's going off in class, and it's, like, debt collectors and shit. And it's just, like, a huge asshole. And the other guy that, like, I mean, doesn't, like... I mean, he's totally an accomplice to the things that are going on at his fucking little parties, basically, and he's well aware of them, and, like, is the, like, uh... I'm not sure how you describe the character, like, or like if there's a if there's a name for that exactly, but he he's the one that lures her in basically, like mm. into the the monster's den, and uh, yeah, it's it's he's like all all surgeons will get a real dark sense of humor working this job. It's like no, dude, you're you're actually just a fucking creep basically, and like yeah, I, I don't feel too terrible and can kind of understand why. Billy the the strip club owner kidnaps him and like because he gets a fucking copy of the video somehow too that's another thing that he watches on his laptop later not in like a salacious way but like I think that's kind of what inspires him to go fucking kidnap this dude and beat the living fuck out of him oh, and for sure. I, I can kind of understand that especially if I was in Billy's shoes and you know I'm definitely hardcore crushing on Mary there's a lot of stuff about yeah the like people being protective in this movie kind of like the the bartender has a way of doing it but also billy has a way of doing it and you know i mean he did a terrible thing but like i don't know i guess as a guy i could kind of understand where he's coming from a little bit oh yeah yeah, yeah. right like if you're billy and see this horrifying video you would be like and especially knowing that billy is capable of some dark shit yep you know not not the craziest thing also um uh, that guy, Clay St. Thomas, is the guy who plays Dr. Walsh. Uh, big voice actor. Does a lot of okay. animated stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's... Like, I, again, it's not a cast that's, like, you know, a lot of recognizable names, but everybody kind of brings it. And is is very good. Um, which I appreciate. Like, I, I'm totally fine with a movie that has you know non-named actors if they're if they're all sort of pulling the cart the same direction you know um like nobody thinks they're above this movie which is something that can happen with kind of indie horror sometimes where it's like all right well i'm just gonna chew the scenery and um everybody here kind of understands that they're making something or at least acts as if they're making something that's a little bit above the average horror fair yeah they, they all play it super straight so um all right let's let's get into themes because the that's where this movie kind of shines i think is you know it is obviously a movie about a a an independent woman um kind of running headfirst into the patriarchal structure of the school um it's about women being marginalized uh, of having to you know i mean i'm sure there's a little bit of a, a metaphor for the soska sisters of like you know sometimes you got to get a little creative if you're going to make it in a business that's largely run by men um you know that you could kind of argue uh on a thematic level that this is a movie that is sort of about their journey as filmmakers in a largely male dominated industry like you know making movies yep and you you got to get a little weird with it but if you get weird with it people are gonna come fucking <laughs> gunning for you yeah and i and i think that's you know uh th this is still fairly early on in their careers but um you know i think there is definitely an aspect of that and the other one that i jotted down is is this um the sort of the the story of ruby real doll which is if a woman tries to control her body then that is generally frowned upon by the men who see them as property yes um so it's you know kind That's of well well said man <laughs> that's it thank you uh but it's kind of thematically dense there's a lot of a lot of ideas at work in this movie and i mean i don't think any of them are knee-jerk man-hating 
or anything, no. it, you know, uh, you can run into movies that feel a little like that uh, uh, Black Christmas 2019. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, we've been over that ground. But, you know, like this is kind of the elevated version of that, of, of having that discussion of the way that men control everything and the struggle of a woman to live in that world and how you like fight against it and ultimately lose a lot of times like this is the that conversation done by people who are a little more thoughtful beyond the main part of it yep absolutely that's i i, I was really interested to hear your 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 take on this because i knew i knew you'd probably put it into much better words than i can uh Oh. But, but yeah, yeah. The like I said earlier in the show, there there's a lot going on in this movie. It made me feel a lot of feels, and a lot of them were deeply uncomfortable. And parts of it made me really sad. And like I realize that's not really themes that I'm talking about. That's, that's more like a you know, this is a, this is a difference. Like the emotions that a movie can like make you feel. But um, yeah, there's. <laughs> There's a, lot, there's a lot going on in this. I, 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 the, the one I, th I think the big one that I took away is just like the things that's sad to say about like not feeling comfortable in your body, basically, and like it made, you know, it. I, I think this is a, a great movie for the, you know, this is a, a pro, this is a pro body modification movie. Like it, it really, it's kind of a, a movie that's all about like your body is your own and how you choose to express yourself and also how you choose to live your life is yeah. nobody else's fucking business yeah yeah that's 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 pretty much that's kind of the long and short of it you know but there's a cost to it right because you, you do that and and society is going to look at you in a certain way like there's that scene where Beatrice brings the dress to Mary after she did the thing for Ruby and you know Ruby is outside school and it, like or not Mary is outside school and Mary's feeling very self-conscious and a little embarrassed of, of Beatrice um, and you know like Beatrice like I was saying earlier like Beatrice is a wonderful character who is nothing but like friendly and giving and kind but the first reaction everyone has to her in most society is going to be like oh my god what a freak and it, that's why i think beatrice is like secretly kind of one of the strongest characters of the movie other than the fact that she ended up giving up mary's name and address after somebody beat the shit out of her but Nah. Yeah, I mean, what do you? Oh, I would too. <laughs> like, I'm, I ain't above it. I'll, I'll, I'll turn coat on somebody if the pain gets uh, to a certain point. If like it's me, or if it's that or death. Um, but you know, like Beatrice, it, it, but immediately calls Mary too. Is like, you know, I'm sorry I did this, but I just I couldn't take it anymore. And and so yeah, I think I, I think to your point, I think there is a lot of that in this movie of you know here is here is a woman who is living the life that she chooses the way that she chooses to do it and is kind of looked down on for it yeah also i i just remembered the great scene like when mary's you know basically her body modification business is like first taking off kind of we get like kind of the fun little montage where i think we get some real life body modification like extras that mm -hmm. come in and do fo photo shoots like for her portfolio basically like you know there's somebody with like a split tongue and there's a chick that's had her nipples modified to look like little hearts and uh like it's kind of a great it's it's a great little montage and like you know you can kind of see it on mary's face as she's like taking pictures of these people that like she's you know really starting to enjoy her work and like these you know she's got her just got a set of clients you know it's it's not any different than you know uh you know other lines of work basically like you know tattoo artists and piercers and you know stuff like that kind of like it's it's and uh <laughs> the the last guy that comes in is the guy that 
I'm pretty sure, I mean, they, they really briefly show it because I think they were maybe still trying to get an R rating on this thing, but does that last dude have his fucking dick split? Yep. And he he comes in because he was, and she she told him not to not to have sex, so he went home and like apparently furiously masturbated right. and got it all uh, like infected and like you know inflamed and pissed off looking basically. She's <laughs> like, I you know I thought that was implied that like, you know that also meant no masturbation. It means don't fucking touch it for a little while. <laughs> And well, yeah, that, that's that's when she like finds out. Yeah, the cop is coming over for a second. Time. She's like, you you gotta go. Get out of here, freak weirdo. This, this dude's like he, he's in like a denim like battle vest, and I think he has like the forehead implants that make it look like he's got like little stubby devil horns. Basically, like he looks like a dude that you know would hit, be, be run into like in a, like a tool show or something. Yeah, like you know, which you know, I, I'm saying this in in much respect and adoration for these people i don't i don't think people that are into this sort of thing are weirdos or anything but like <laughs> she, she's like i don't want the cops seeing what the fuck i'm doing in here basically and he might you know get kind of a clue if he sees you and your inflamed split dick <laughs> That is very funny. That that whole bit. Of, oh, I didn't think you meant jerking off. I thought that was implied. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize that you were that stupid. But fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah. It's and I, you know, I guess that kind of brings us to to our final thoughts on the film, and and we'll rate this this movie up. Um, as always, scale of one to five. Uh, half stars are allowed, not quarter stars, because we are not monsters here. Um, so I'll, I will say this about American Mary. Like I said, uh, in the upfront, I hadn't seen it in a long time. I remembered really responding to it and really liking it. When I went back and watched it again, I had not just the same reaction. I thought it was really, you know, kind of prescient in a lot of ways that it feels like a movie that could be made today and be just as relevant like all of yeah. uh, everything about this movie all the stuff that makes this movie interesting to me is still stuff that we as a society are dealing with i think we're a little further down the road i think that there's a little bit more of a, a sense of acceptance for people who lead alternate lifestyles lifestyles or maybe that's just me being soft in my old age where i'm like eh, i don't give a shit what anybody does as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else god bless you know um but i yeah i it's still a movie that would, like it it kind of gut punches me at the end of the movie like i i know that a Mar that mary has to die because of what she has done but i also don't want her to I, like i'm still rooting for her, even though that she is a murderer you know not just with dr grant because you know that dude had it coming but yeah uh as far as dr walsh uh you know or not dr walsh but the security guard it's like yeah i mean i know that she took a life that she shouldn't have but i i still you see her go through so much that even when she is kind of at her bottom and like threatening <laughs> you know strippers in the bathroom with her surgical instruments and stuff you're still like you know i i just want you to pull up on the stick and get out of this and not not completely crater yeah. uh, even though that's where the movie has to go um but i i love it i think it's a terrific movie Yep. Uh, yeah, this this movie's a ride. Uh, I <laughs> I wish I would have seen this ten years ago because I mean this this movie. Uh, yeah, ten years later, it, it feels super ahead of its time. Uh, like I said, a lot of the things that like not even ten years ago, I think maybe would have seemed a lot more taboo. Like now, there's you know sixteen year olds that have Tumblr blogs dedicated to this whole whole entire thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm dating myself by even mentioning Tumblr, but uh, th that aside, like, um, <laughs> I, I dug the shit out of this movie. Yeah, it definitely, it, it's got some gut punch moments. There were some scenes, there, there's some gross, gross violence in this. Like, I wouldn't really call this, like, a super bloody movie, but, like, when, when this movie goes for the violence and goes for the scalpel, uh, it's pretty fucked up and pretty gruesome, so... There, there was a couple times where I was definitely shouting at my TV last night, and 
uh, yeah, I, I like a movie that gets a visceral reaction out of me like this one did. There's, there's a lot of stuff that like just like either knocked me over emotionally or like was so fucking gross and just so morbid that like I, you know, <laughs> I'd be screaming at my fucking TV while it's playing. So yeah, I, I, I dug this a lot. I, I wish I would have seen this a long time ago. All right, well, let's rate it then. I am going to uh, give this movie... Uh, I, this is, I think a four and a half out of five for me. I really like it. I think I, I've got a minor quibbles with some of the third act stuff. I think things get a little loosey goosey narratively, but yeah. other than that, I just like, I think Catherine Isabel is so good in it. I think Tristan risk is so good in it. I think what the movie has to say is, you know, important and well said and, I, I just kind of love it. I think it's terrific. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I'd give this... I, this is a solid four out of five. And really, like, I don't... I can't really pinpoint any, like, major gripes with this movie. Like, why why this is, like, a solid five out of five. I, I, I don't know. Mostly because it's it's hard subject matter. Like, this isn't something I can just throw on, like, any time and just be, like... And, like, this is, this is kind of a movie you gotta, like, I don't know like prepare yourself a little bit for because it goes to some like really fucking dark places for sure for sure yeah it's not like hey we're having a party everybody let's gather around and watch american mary <laughs> double uh, feature this with like irreversible or something right yeah no we're all gonna feel totally shitty after this movie's <laughs> over but uh i think you're gonna really learn something um all right well let, let's do uh some some information that you may or may not know three facts uh, about American Mary that listeners may not be privy to. One um, is maybe this little bit of a cheat, so I'm probably going to do four. But the first one is um, every special effect in this movie is practical. It is a movie that the Soska sisters uh, wanted to do practically, and they sure as hell did. And I think it's uh, much appreciated. I think that's great. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I mean, I mean there's, there's nothing really in this that's like too fantastical that you couldn't like like a lot of the makeup effects are just like li probably little pieces like we, we need a couple shots where like she's slicing into a boob so make us a, a latex boob that we can cut into the like bleeds and shit like they're probably like yeah that's uh, like I, I don't think this thing had like a probably super monster makeup effects budget even though there's some grisly shit like well and even like sewing up the chickens in the opening scene is like uh it's it's kind of gross and it was probably like a five dollar effect kind of so <laughs> yeah i mean they 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 I, they they worked with their low budget really well on this thing and like they got a lot of mileage out of little tiny pieces um number eh, let's call this number one well the, the special effects is just a bonus um number one the character of mary mason aka america mary um was written by the soska sisters with Catherine isabel in mind uh, they wanted her to do the movie after all three of them, the Soska sisters and uh, Catherine Isabel, had worked together as extras on Josie and the Pussycats in 2001. Wow, that's... Uh, I, I haven't seen that one. I haven't even thought about that movie in a great long time. But uh, yeah, I remember that. Fuck, I should, maybe I should go back and watch that and be like, oh, there's the Soskas, they're extras. Yeah, I mean, I think it's crazy that in a weird way Josie and the Pussycats is a the origin of this movie <laughs> uh, yeah that's and, and now I gotta go back and watch that movie and be like there are parallels between Josie and the Pussycats and American Mary they're the same film <laughs> number two the Soska sisters parents remortgaged their house to raise money to finance this movie and for that uh, contribution, both of their parents uh, do cameo in this movie. Huh. I wonder who their parents play. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I don't have that information in front of me, but 
Uh, I bet on a rewatch, it would probably be fairly obvious because that's probably something super innocuous. Like, I'm sure they didn't want to. <laughs> I don't know, depending on what kind of parents they have. Maybe maybe they're down with being in a scene where they get like blood thrown on them or something. But yeah, I bet they're, I bet, I bet it's like they're like, you know, store clerk or some shit. It's, it's probably something super, super safe. Sure. Somebody in the hospital, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, and the third and last thing you uh, probably don't know about American Mary, and it's the thing I like most, the bit of trivia, is that uh, Ave Maria is used three times in the movie. And the first time, it is uh, very amateurish. It is with played with fewer instruments. Uh, halfway through the movie, roughly, it is played again with a more complex arrangement. And then the final time is, of course at the end of the film where you hear the full you know the gorgeous version of ave maria it is done this way to represent the growing skill mary has as a surgeon and so that every time you hear it played she is a little bit better at her job that is cool as hell that that is an awesome little detail i, I love stuff like or like yeah whoever I'm not sure who did the score on this movie but yeah the, that piece is a big part of the the score but also there's you know like uh some interstitial stuff between that kind of where it's one of the scores that doesn't like really call attention to itself and like is only there when it's needed kind of which i think is always an interesting balancing act because i've i've written music for a couple of my friends like you know youtube short films or whatever and there's always the temptation to just like jam pack as much of your fucking sound and music into the thing as possible but there's a real art to like limiting yourself and only putting stuff in as needed and yeah that, that I, I can't remember another movie that did something like along those lines that, that, that is a cool little fact yeah uh peter allen is the guy's name who did the movie for this i mean he's done a, a million things a lot of uh a, a lot of family movies and horror movies kind of a you know I would, uh, I, with, w I am putting no, uh, judgment on, on this, but kind of that B level music composer of right. like, he's not a Hans Zimmer or something, but the guy is, has been working steadily for about the past, eh, 20 years. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, eh, that ain't nothing. Um, but anyway, all right. So that is American Mary. Uh, again, it is a movie that I full throatedly recommend. If you've never seen American Mary, and you absolutely should watch it. Like even with us describing it, this is a movie that will genuinely, I think, takes you on kind of an emotional journey uh, with this character that is like well, occasionally very funny. Sometimes it, it's really shocking sometimes it's really sad it's it's terrific it's just a great movie agreed this is uh yeah this is a strong recommend if, if you're in the mood for something like fairly dark and morbid and kind of fucked up uh, this, <laughs> yeah. this, especially you know the the assault on the school yeah this, this is you know this has almost every trigger warning of things that like are going to make you super uncomfortable and that, that, that's this movie so uh yeah i i i, I as i say often i salute the balls on this movie yeah absolutely uh mark look it's always a pleasure i i love having you come on and do this stuff uh i we have a good time and uh it is important to me that other people find out where they can hear more of you which is sadly not not a lot of places i i look at the dark parade as like one of the the main thoroughfares of, of Mark Ball Entertainment at this yeah. point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I also make, you know, pretty frequent stops over on uh, fellow Legion show, the Psycho Semantic cast with Darren Wilson. We, we do, we've been doing once a month uh, comic book movies over on there. We just did Judge Dredd at the end of December that popped up on there. Not the Sylvester Stallone one. We did the 2012 the Carl good. Urban one. Yeah, the good one, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, my my other once a month show uh, it's uh, going into this is the third year. Yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure this is the third year. No, maybe it's the second. I forget. Season two of Doing the Nasty. It's the show that I do with Duncan 
over from podcast under the stairs it's about the video nasties um it's been it's been a wild ride we've watched some fucking crazy shit on that show and it's kind of all <laughs> all over the place like these movies that were banned by the british board of film classification in the 80s like these were movies that were going to corrupt your morals and corrupt your children hide your kids hide your wife they're they're doing nasty nasty videos out here um <laughs> but go <laughs> Uh, yeah, go check that out. It's on the, the Teaputs Collective. I think if you just go to teaputscast.com, there is the podcast under the stairs and all the, all, all the great side shows, including Opera Omnia, which you guys just wrapped up the David Fincher series, right? Almost, almost. We've got one more to go. We, we, ah, we haven't damn. done Mank yet. Fincher did a lot of movies, I didn't realize, especially considering he's only been, when did Alien 3 come out? Like 90 two or something yeah and then all the music videos before that like we didn't talk about the music videos but he did a, a oh shit yeah he, well yeah 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 but yeah, his, his features that you guys covered on opera I, mean, I didn't realize fincher had made so many movies but uh yeah i i, I got some catching up to do on that series because i liked a couple of those episodes a lot and fincher's a interesting cat but um yeah, that, that, that's about it for me, at least for the time being. I, I'm kind of I'm, I'm skating along being podcast golden guest star here for a while, and I, I, I love being on other people's shows, you know, stopping by and getting to bullshit with people for a little, little bit of time. Uh, just to confirm, Alien 3 was 92, which means uh, 30 years now, David Fincher has been making movies. He's, he's, he's made... Uh, I want to say mostly bangers, but uh, I'm I'm I'm, think, I'm thinking back and I'm like, wait a minute, no, nah, he, he had to have made a couple shitty movies. He had to have. I mean, curious case of Benjamin Button ain't that great. Let's, okay. let's be honest with one another. <laughs> There's that one, yeah, and which I I've not seen, but I I've heard things and I'm just like, nope, I, I can probably skip that one. Yeah, the game is kind of missable. Like that's not one you have to see. But it's right. surprisingly consistent. Like, of you know, that being said, those two I I would leave out. But everything else he's done is like, eh, it's pretty good, pretty good. Yeah. Um, and Panic Room, son, Panic Room is where it's at. I haven't seen Panic Room since it came out. Same with the game. Like, I I have seen them, but goddamn, that's been it feels like a long time now. Oh man, no, nah, uh, Panic Room is well worth your time to go back to. It's it's very good. I think um, it's on Prime, so yeah, I, mean, I might have to go back and watch that one again. Definitely, you absolutely should, for no other reason than seeing Jared Leto get fucked up in that movie. That's oh satisfying. shit, I forgot he's in that. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Oh yeah, you'll forget. And Dwight Yoakam is a revelation as a, a wonderful villain in that film. Anyway, uh, enough <laughs> of that. Go check that out. Opera <laughs> Omnia. Yeah so anyway thanks again man and uh i'll be right back to close the show so there you have it there is my discussion with mark ball i think that was a really good discussion uh i do think that we brought out what makes the movie kind of work for us and kind of special for us and i really do love this movie i think it's it's great it's as mark said it is not a movie you want to show just anyone uh in your rolodex but it is a terrific film and if you have a differing opinion you can of course uh drop me a line at bo bo at legion podcasts.com and uh let me know why you think that we got it wrong or if we, you uh if you think we got it right then uh say that too as ever i appreciate everyone sharing the show listening to the show downloading the show leaving reviews for the show if you haven't done any of those things if you would i would really appreciate it uh we have been steadily climbing in listenership uh as we've been going which is terrific and i again i really appreciate it thanks for listening to the stuff we do there is more stuff that is coming i promise in fact this very month is probably going to have a couple of special episodes that you either haven't heard or haven't heard in a while uh we'll see how all that shakes out so thank you so so much for listening drop me a line let me know what we can do here on uh the dark parade uh if there is something that you would like to hear now that uh, my personal request month, the, the stuff I wanted to talk about in January is wrapping up. 
February is kind of a listener request month. Um, so I don't know that all the slots are filled, uh, as you listen to this episode. So again, feel free to drop me a line. You can do so, uh, on Twitter at dark parade pod. You can also do that on Facebook at, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade pod. And, uh, you can also email me at bo B O at legion podcasts.com. Uh, I think that's it for now. And as always, thank you so much for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time.